Welcome to the Mormonism, Cosmology, and Plan of Salvation video. First of all, we're going to talk about God, the Mormon God, who is uh, God the Father, or Elohim. And we're going to talk about their belief in many, many gods. And here is a illustration of that. Many, many gods. If we should take a million of worlds like this and number their particles, we should find that there are more gods than there are particles of matter in those worlds. Orson Pratt, Apostle, Journal of Discourses. The Origin of God First, God himself, who sits enthroned in yonder heavens, is a man like unto one of yourselves. This is the great secret. I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined that God was God from all eternity. God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And you have got to learn how to become gods yourself. Joseph Smith, First Prophet, 1844 Times and Seasons, a local church newspaper. The gods who dwell in the heaven have been redeemed from the grave in a world which existed before the foundation of this earth were laid. They and the heavenly body which they now inhabit were once in a fallen state. They were exalted also from fallen men to celestial gods to inhabit their heaven forever and ever. Orson Pratt, Apostle, in his book The Seer. Kolob, God's residence, and other planets. Why cannot we behold the inhabitants of Kolob or the inhabitants of any of those distant planets? Brigham Young, Second Prophet, in the Leahona the Elder's Journal, another church paper. And we are now coming to some slides that are best viewed in full screen, so please change your video to full screen if you haven't done so already. This is a hymn called If You Could Hide a Kolob, written by W. W. Phelps, a contemporary of Joseph Smith. And it goes like this. If you could hide a kolob, which means go quickly to kolob, in the twinkling of an eye, and then continue onward with that same speed to fly, do you think that you could ever, through all eternity, find out the generation where gods began to be? Okay, we're coming up to an interesting slide now that shows the cosmology of the Mormon Church. They got this information from sources such as the Grammar and Alphabet of the Egyptian Language by Joseph Smith, which we'll go over a little bit after this. Uh, the facsimiles found in the Book of Abraham, uh, the Pearl of Great Price, uh, you can find these terms mentioned. The first area is the binary star system, which has Kolob, the star nearest the throne of God, and Olablish, below that is 12 other planetary systems. Uh, below that is Inish Goandosh, which is the sun. Moving over to the 15 fixed stars in the middle, there's Kliflo Is S and Ha Kokabim. Kolob, if you follow those arrows, uh, they are meant, meant to represent a source of light over there to the 15 fixed stars and, and those other two. And follow the arrows from Inish Goandosh uh, over to Jaoe, which is the Earth. And Flowey is the moon. Those uh, arrows, again, are a source of light. And in that same box is the 15 moving planets. Following Kliflo SS over to Kai E. Van Rosh, which is the governing key. Also sources of light pointing over there. Following Jaoe. Uh, which is the Earth, we can then go to the Celestial Kingdom, the Terrestrial Kingdom, and the Telestial Kingdom, and a very few into Outer Darkness. Uh, those darker lines are the destination of sinners and non-Mormons, uh, except for the Celestial Kingdom. And uh, that is it. Okay, here is a copy of the actual grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language by Joseph Smith. This is a very interesting document. It has all kinds of strange things in it. And it's a very early document and foundational to many of the teachings of Joseph Smith. Um, and we will 
read some out of this document next. Okay, we are now reading out of that Egyptian grammar and alphabet. Adamon di Amun is mentioned, which is a fruit garden made to be fruitful by blessing or promise, great valley or plain given by a promise, filled with fruit trees and precious flowers, made for the healing of man, good to the taste, pleasing to the eye, sweet and delightful to the smell, place of happiness, purity, holiness, and rest, even Zomar, which is Zion. Also mentioned in this document is Lish Zihoi Upayota, the glory of the celestial kingdom, is the interpretation of that. The connection of attributes, many parts perfected and compounded into one, having been united, being united, one glory above all other glories, as the excels the moon in light, and this glory excels being filled with the same glory, equality. Okay, moving on to the next term, Jatniha, which is one delegated from the highest source acting in or being clothed with the power of another, one sent from the celestial kingdom. Then Jaoe, which is the earth under the governing power of Olablish, Inish Goan Dash, and Kai Van Rosh, the governing power, which governs the 15 fixed stars, which you mentioned in the uh, graphic that governs the earth, the sun, and the moon, which have their power in one, with the other 12 moving planets of this system, which we mentioned, Olablish, Inish Goan Dash, and Kai Van Rosh, are the three central are the three grand central powers that govern all the other creations which have been sought out by the most aged of all the fathers since the beginning of the creation by means of the Urim and Thummim. Then it says the names of the other twelve of the fixed stars are and this is important the twelve fixed star names which a lot of Mormons may not be aware of are Kolob, Limdi, Zip, Vesul, Vinisti, Wayne, Wyoxoan, Oansli, Shibble, Shinflis, Fliss, Os, and also the Egyptian names of the 15 moving planets are, so these are the 15 moving planets, Oanesis, Flosis, Floes, Abacellus, Ilish, Subble, Slundlo, Karum, Krashmakra, Oblisisium, and Isenshiba, Missile, Nabmesil, Oiupupsa, and Zul. Sorry if I mispronounced some of those. Maybe somebody can correct me. And also Floes, which is the moon, the earth, and the sun, and their annual revolutions. Flos, Flos Isis, the highest degree of light, because its component parts are light, the governing principle of light, because God has said, let this be the center for light. He hath set a cloud round about in the heavens and the light of the gov and the light of the grand governing of the 15 fixed stars center there and from there it is drawn by the heavenly bodies according to their portions according to the decrees that God hath set whoo mouthful all right we're going to read some more out of this grammar and alphabet Cle flociasis which signifies kolob in its motion which is swifter than the rest of the 12 fixed stars going before, being first in motion, being delegated to have power over others to regulate others in their time. Then we have Va, Kli, Flos, Isis, which signifies less power than the fourth fixed governing star, but greater power than the sixth governing fixed star in consequence of its slowness of motion. Kolob, which signifies the first creation near to the celestial, or the residence of God, first in government, the last pertaining to the measurement of time, the measurement according to, to celestial time, which signifies one day to a cubit, which day is equal to a thousand years according to the measurement of this earth, or Jaoe. This language about Kolob is very similar to the language found in facsimile number two, figure one in the book of Abraham. Next is Ebeth Kuai Treath, which is a place beyond this earth, a future place of existence, a place of residence beyond this earth, the celestial world, the heavenly bodies, the earth in its most sanctified state as it shall be in eternity. Then we have Datu Hadiz, which is hell, another kingdom, the least kingdom, a kingdom without glory, the whole kingdom and the dominion of darkness with all its degrees and parts governed by the dragon, him who is an enemy to God. So maybe that dragon is Satan. Source for this is Grammar and Alphabet of the Egyptian Language by Joseph Smith, Jr. 
excerpts were taken from pages 23 to 33. This was written in 1835 and is a foundational uh, source of the Mormon Church. You can read the entire thing on Wikisource, and there's two other great links about the grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language and uh, also the, in the entire text. All right, moving on to the next slide. Joseph Smith said that the god Kanum represents the planet Kolob. Hmm. Number one, Kolob, signifying the first creation nearest to the celestial or the residence of God, first in government, the last pertaining to the measurement of time, the measurement according to celestial time, which celestial time signifies one day to a cubit. One day in Kolob is equal to a thousand years according to the measurement of this earth, which is called by the Egyptians Jaoe. This text is actually from the Book of Abraham, facsimile 2, uh, from Joseph Smith's explanation for item or image number 1. So again, we notice that the original language for this was found in the Egyptian alphabet. All right, moving to the next slide. Joseph Smith said that the god Amun Re represents the planet Olablish. Hmm. Number 2. Stands next to Kolob, called by the Egyptians Olablish, which is the next grand governing creation near to the celestial or the place where God resides, holding the key of power also pertaining to other planets as revealed from God to Abraham. Book of Abraham, facsimile number two, Joseph Smith explanation for item or image number two. Joseph Smith said the cow of Hathor represents the planet Inish Goandash. Hmm. Number five is called an Egyptian Inish Goandash. This is one of the governing planets also and is said by the Egyptians to be the sun and to borrow its light from Kolob through the medium of Kai Von Rash, which is the grand key, or in other words, the governing power, which governs 15 other fixed planets or stars, as also Flowies or the moon, the earth and the sun, in their annual revolutions. This planet receives its power through the medium of Cliflociasis, or ha Koka beam the stars represented by numbers 22 and 23, receiving light from the revolutions of Kolob. This is from Book of Abraham, facsimile number 2, Joseph Smith, explanation for item and image number 5. Here we have a nice picture of the Salt Lake City Temple tying to Kolob. And here's a quote uh, from the Mormon scripture. And thus there shall be the reckoning of time of one planet above another until thou come nigh unto Kolob, which Kolob is after the reckoning of the Lord's time, which Kolob is set nigh unto the throne of God to govern all those planets which belong to the same order of that upon which thou standest. And it is given unto thee to know the set time of all the stars that are set to give light until thou come near unto the throne of God. This is from the Pearl of Great Price, being a choice selection from the revelations, translations, and narrations of Joseph Smith, the first prophet, seer, and revelator to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 1878 edition found in Google Books. Kolob was revealed by the Urim and Thummim. Here is a picture of the ancient instruments uh, mentioned in the Old Testament. And another quote from Mormon scripture. And I, Abraham, had the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God had given unto me in Ur of the Chaldees, and I saw the stars, that they were very great, and that one of them was nearest unto the throne of God, and there were many great ones which were near unto it. And the Lord said unto me, These are the governing ones, and the name of the great one is Kola, because it is near unto me. For I am the Lord thy God. I have set this one to govern all those which belong to the same order of that upon which thou standest. And the Lord said unto me by the Urim and Thummim that Kolob was after the manner of the Lord. Again, the Pearl of Great Price, a Mormon scripture, 1878 edition, found in Google Books. Okay, here's another interesting astronomy map of Mormon cosmology. Here in the center is the Celestial, and they have the planets Kolob, which is near the celestial, rotating around it, as well as Olablish and Inish Goandash. This, is, uh, this map is called the Celestial and the Grand Governing Creation. 
um, and it shows sources as facsimile 2, figures 1, 2, and 5. Also information out of the Book of Abraham. Okay, reading another passage out of the Pearl of Great Price. And he, the Lord, said unto me, Abraham, this is Shinha, which is the sun. And he said unto me, Kokob, which is star. And he said unto me, Olia, which is the moon. And he said unto me, Kokabim, which signifies stars, or all the great lights, which were in the firmament of heaven. And the Lord spake unto these words unto me, I will multiply thee, and thy seed after thee, like unto these. And if thou canst count the number of sands, so shall be the number of thy seeds. That sounds like a lot. And the Lord said unto me, Abraham, I show these things unto thee before ye go into Egypt, that ye may declare all these words. If two things exist, and there be one above the other, there shall be greater things above them. Therefore Kolob is the greatest of all the Kokabim that thou hast seen, because it is nearest unto me. Now if there be two things, one above the other, and the, mo and the moon be above the earth, then it may be that a planet or a star may exist above it. How be it that he made the greater star, as also they existed before, they shall have no end, they shall exist after, for they are nolam, which I guess means eternal. Again, Pearl Great Price, 1878 edition. Okay, doing a little bit of further research. You can study the word Adam on Diamon, which is really the Garden of Eden in the Mormon Church. Uh, it was not mentioned in the Book of Commandments in 1833. It was mentioned in the grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language in 1835. The Adam on Diamond site near Kansas City, Missouri, again, Garden of Eden, was dedicated by Joseph Smith in 1838, three years after the grammar and alphabet. It is mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants, Book of Mormon Scripture, in 1852, and is actually still mentioned in the current edition of the Pearl Great Price, 2011. Okay, studying the word kolob, not mentioned in the Book of Commandments of 1833, was mentioned in Grammar and Alphabet of the Egyptian Language in 1835, mentioned in facsimile 2, figure 1, in the Times and Seasons in 1842, mentioned in the Pearl Great Price in 1878, mentioned in the current edition of the Pearl Great Price 2011. Uh, also, same thing, Jaoe. Uh, you go through 1835, 1842, 1907, 1976 in the current edition. And then Olablish, same thing, moving from the grammar and alphabet, 1835, times and season, 1842, Pearl of Great Price, 1907, and then current edition of 2011. I wanted to do this research to see where these words came from. And uh, it turns out that the grammar and alphabet is a very important work and foundational to these terms. If somebody can find Kolob, Jawe, and Olablish mentioned before 1835, I would like to know about it. Um, because I wanted to kind of establish the importance of this document as it mentions many, many other planets that uh, a lot of other Mormons, uh, a lot of Mormons may not know about. And moving on to the next slide, same thing with Inish Goandash, first mentioned in Grammar and Alphabet in 1835, still mentioned today. Kai Ivan Rosh, first mentioned in 1835, still mentioned today. And Flois, same thing, first mentioned in Grammar and Alphabet 1835, still in the current edition of the Pearl Great Price. And Clyflo Isis, same thing, first mentioned in 1835, Grammar and Alphabet, still mentioned today. So again, if anybody can find mention of these things earlier than 1835, I would like to know. Okay, moving on to the next slide. The terms coca beam, first mentioned in Times and Seasons in 1842, still mentioned in the current Pearl Great Price. Shine Ha, first mentioned in Times and Seasons 1842, still mentioned today. Olia, same thing, Times and Seasons 1842, still mentioned today in 2011. Uh, these stars and planets are only mentioned in grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language, 1835. So in establishing a cosmology here, uh, these are very important. Uh, the names of other planets and stars, which are Limdi, Zip, Vesuo, Venisti, Wayne, Weo, Oxon, 
O ansli shibul shine flis flis os o anisis flos isis ve cli flos isis eba islis elish subble slundlo karum cra crash makra oblisis i'm isn ba mizzle namasil oi upa za zul e beth ku i treath and dua tua hadis now i'm sure i didn't pronounce some of those wrong maybe i didn't pronounce some of those right maybe somebody can correct me and uh, let me know how they're supposed to be pronounced god's spirit children this doctrine that there is a mother in heaven was affirmed in plainness by the first presidency of the church they said that man as a spirit was begotten and born of heavenly parents and reared to maturity in the eternal mansions of the father that man is the offspring of celestial parentage and that all men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother and are literally the sons and daughters of deity Bruce R. McConkie, Apostle and Mormon Doctrine, 1979. And by literally are we to interpret this pre-earthly offspring being conceived through sexual relationships between God and his heavenly wife or wives? So here we are establishing uh, part of the plan of salvation, the God's spirit children. Was God a polygamous? We have now clearly shown that God the Father had a plurality of wives, means more than one, one or more being in eternity, by whom he begat our spirits, as well as the spirit of Jesus, his firstborn, and another being upon the earth, uh, one of the wives maybe was Mary, by whom he begat the tabernacle of Jesus, as his only begotten in this world, Orson Pratt Apostle in his book The Seer. Adam was God the Father? Was Adam a God? Was he a God under Elohim the Father? Or was he actually Elohim? Well, let's read and maybe we can figure it out. Now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body. Kind of sounds like a God. And brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. So he was a polygamous. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Every man upon the earth, professing Christian or non-professing, must hear it and will know it. Sooner or later, Brigham Young, Second Prophet, Journal of Discourses. How much unbelief exists in the minds of the Latter-day Saints in regard to one particular doctrine which I reveal to them and which God revealed to me, namely that Adam is our father and God. Our father Adam helped to make this earth. He brought one of his wives with him. and Then he said, I want my children who are in the spirit world to come and live here. I once dwelt upon an earth something like this in a mortal state. I want my children that were born to me in the spirit world, see that sounds like our Father God, to come here and take tabernacles of flesh that their spirits may have a house, a tabernacle, or a dwelling place as mine has. And where is the mystery? Brigham Young, Second Prophet, Deseret Evening News, 1873. All right, we've mentioned uh, some information about the planets, about Kolob, about spirit world about god what about the pre-existence the mormon be mormons believed that we did exist before we came here they call it the pre-existence there was a war in heaven one-third of the spirits followed lucifer and were cast out never to be born on earth the other two-thirds followed christ's plan and would be born on earth there were th different degrees of righteousness amongst the righteous two-thirds however the most righteous would become prophets, apostles, teachers for God, etc. Wikipedia Mormon Cosmology. So that's a little bit about our pre-existence. Those that were less righteous or neutral in the pre-existence were born with black skins. We cannot escape the conclusion that because of performance in our pre-existence, some of us are born as Chinese, some as Japanese, some as Indians, some as Negroes, some Americans, some as Latter-day Saints. 
These are rewards and punishments. Is it not reasonable to believe that less worthy spirits would come through less favored lineage? Let us consider the great mercy of God for a moment. The Chinese born in China with a dark skin and with all the handicaps of that race seems to have little opportunity. But think of the mercy of God to Chinese people who are willing to accept the gospel. In spite of whatever they might have done in the pre-existence to justify being born over there as Chinamen, if they now in this life accept the gospel and live it the rest of their lives, they can have the priesthood go to the temple and receive endowments and sealings, and that means they can have exaltation. Think of the Negro cursed as to the priesthood. This Negro who in the pre-existence lived the type of life which justified the Lord in sending him to the earth in the lineage of Cain with a black skin. In spite of all he did in the pre-existent life, the Lord is willing if the Negro accepts the gospel, he can and will enter the celestial kingdom. He will go there as a servant, but he will get celestial glory. Race problems as they affect the church and addressed by the Apostle Mark E. Peterson in 1954. Okay, let's learn a little bit more about the pre-existence. According to the doctrine of the church, the Negro, because of some condition of unfaithfulness in the spirit world or pre-existence, was not valiant and hence was not denied the mortal probation, but was denied the blessings of the priesthood. Letter to Joseph H. Henderson, April 10th, 1963, by the Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith. Okay, let's read another one from Joseph Fielding Smith, who became the 10th prophet of the Mormon Church. There is a reason why one man is born black and with other disadvantages, while another is born white with great advantages. The reason is that we once had an estate before we came here, which was the pre-existence, and were obedient more or less to the laws that were given us there. And I guess the blacks were not. Doctrines of Salvation, Sermons and Writings of Joseph Fielding Smith, 1954. Okay, let's move on with cosmology. What do the Mormons think of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, who they call Jehovah? Well, God came down and had sex with Mary in order to conceive Jesus. Hmm. These name titles all signify that our Lord is the only Son of the Father in the flesh. Each of the words is to be understood literally. Only means only, begotten means begotten, and Son means Son. Christ was begotten by an immortal Father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. Well, that sounds like sex to me. Bruce R. McConkie, Apostle, 1979, Mormon Doctrine. Uh, was the book he wrote. Here's a nice little cartoon. Poor Joseph, God was a hard act to follow. Okay, here's another passage reiterating. And Christ was born into the world as the literal son of this holy being. He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. There is nothing figurative about his paternity. He was begotten, conceived, and born in the normal and natural course of events. Christ is the Son of Man, meaning that his Father, the Eternal God, is a holy man. Bruce R. McConkie again, Apostle Mormon Doctrine, 1979. And another one by Orson Pratt. The fleshly body of Jesus required a mother as well as a father. Therefore, the mother and... The father and mother of Jesus, according to the flesh, must have been associated together in the capacity of husband and wife. Hence, the Virgin Mary must have been, for the time being, the lawful wife of God the Father. Well, we would hope so if they are going to have sex. Orson Pratt, Apostle, in his book, The Seer, 1853. We have read passages stating that God and Adam were polygamous. Well, what about Christ? Some of the Eastern papers represent me as a great blasphemer because I said in my lecture on marriage that Jesus Christ was married, that Mary, Martha, and others were his wives, and that he begat children. 
All that I have to say in reply to that charge is this. They worship a Savior that is too pure and holy to fulfill the commands of his Father. I worship one that is just pure and holy enough to fulfill all righteousness, not only the righteous law of baptism, but the still more righteous and important law to multiply and replenish the earth. So that must be a lot easier if you have two or three wives. And here is a picture of Brigham Young, second prophet of the Mormon Church, with some of his wives fulfilling that everlasting covenant and commandment that we have been reading about. And here's a quote from Brigham Young, second prophet on polygamy being necessary for salvation. The only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Doesn't get any more direct than that. And also, at one time, Joseph Smith told Heber C. Kimball that if he did not enter into polygamy, he would lose his apostleship and be damned. Life of Heber C. Kimball, Kimball Orson Ferguson Whitney Apostle, 1888. Okay, we're supposed to be talking about Jesus Christ and how he fits into the plan of salvation in the Mormon Church. Jesus is as much a supreme being as Joseph Smith. Hmm, let's think about that one for a minute. No man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. Every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith, Jr. as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. I cannot go there without his consent. He reigns there as a supreme being in his sphere, capacity, and calling as God does in heaven. Wow. As a supreme being. Joseph Smith. And that is a quote from Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses. Well, there's been some talk about Joseph Smith being similar to Jesus Christ in the Mormon Church. This passage doesn't help with that matter. Uh, as suggested earlier, the life of Joseph Smith was in some degree patterned after that of his master, Jesus Christ. That pattern holds true even when extended to its tragic conclusion. Like his master, Joseph Smith also shed his blood in order that the final testament, the reestablishment of the new covenant, might be in full effect. So that is a strange comment about Joseph shedding his blood in order that the final testament, the reestablishment of the new covenant, might be in full effect. That was by Robert L. Millett and Joseph Smith Among the Prophets, 1994. Robert Millett was Dean of Religious Education at BYU and a Mormon Bishop. Okay, well, let's read a little bit more about this. Uh, in a Salt Lake Temple Assembly, July 2, 1899, the Apostle George Q. Cannon made the following disclosure, after which Lorenzo Snow, fifth prophet, confirmed his statement. And it goes like this. President George Q. Cannon also spoke on the law of tithing. Among the other things he said, there are those in this audience who are the descendants of the old twelve apostles. And shall I say it? Yes, descendants of the Savior himself. His seed is represented in this body of men. So here we're talking again about Christ having children and then some of those children showing up in the Mormon church. Following President Cannon, President Snow, who was the prophet of the church, arose and said that what Brother Cannon had stated respecting the literal descendants among this company of the old apostles and the Savior himself is true. The Savior seed is represented in this body of men. This is in the journal of Rudger Clausen, Apostle. So we can imagine what these early Mormon leaders thought of Joseph Smith. Uh, I'm sure they thought that he was in this category. And also in the same line of thinking, in Heber, who was a Mormon apostle, his character, manner, and methods, we say it reverently, there was much of the Christ, the might of the lion, with the meekness of the lamb. His also was the Savior's lineage, 
in his heart a kindred spirit, in his veins the selfsame blood. Where causes are similar, should there not spring similar results? Again, Life of Heber C. Kimball, 1888, by Orson F. Whitney, future apostle. So he's talking about the blood of Jesus Christ in the veins of Heber C. Kimball. All right, let's read another one. Hidden in the blood of many LDS Mormons runs the blood of Israel from numerous directions, including that of the Savior. So the blood of the Savior is hidden in the blood of many Mormons. But it is specifically through the divine blood rite of Christ, through Joseph Smith, Jr., that all members of the church are lawful heirs of this promise. So he's talking about Mormons with the blood of Christ flowing through them. And then he talks about Joseph Smith and the divine blood rite of Christ through him. So to me, that is strongly hinting that he is a direct descendant of Jesus Christ. Let's read another one. Uh, that one was by Brigham Young, Second Prophet. Uh, here's another one. The prophet Joseph Smith stated to her repshire that Judge Adams was a literal descendant of Jesus Christ. The judge died in Nauvoo and so on. Oliver B. Oliver B. Huntington Journal, 1906. All right, well, let's get to a more direct quote about Jesus the Christ. Because he, Jesus, lived a perfect and sinless life, Jesus could offer himself as an infinite and eternal sacrifice that would be required to pay for the sins of all of the other children of God. 2009 Gospel Principles of the LDS Church. And keep in mind that it is also expected of each Mormon member to strive for perfection in keeping God's commandments. Uh, the Savior's sacrifice was not enough to save Mormons. Uh, Mormons have to do many, many other things uh, to make it into heaven. Okay, this is an interesting map of Mormon plan of salvation. The first circle there is realms of deity, spirit life, or first estate. That is the pre-existence. Uh, we live there as spirits, as offspring of eternal father and mother. And then we were born, came down to our second estate, which is the earth, where the automobile is there. Uh, and we followed Christ's plan, so we chose the plan of free agency, uh, not the devil's plan. And if we take the high road up to the celestial kingdom, you got to get on the freeway, which starts with faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Have to live a moral life, loyal uh, to the church and uh, to everything righteous, I suppose. Pay your tithing, which is 10% to the Mormon church. Keep the word of wisdom, which means no alcohol, coffee, tea, or tobacco, or smoking. Do your duty to the church. Honor your priesthood. Keep uh, diligent in all your church callings. Get married in the temple and a celestial marriage to your husband and wife. Uh, you cannot make it into the celestial kingdom alone. You have to be married. And then if you do all that, you'll make it into the top kingdom of the celestial kingdom. There's three degrees up there. You're aiming for number one. And then we have terrestrial kingdom, which is the road of Broadway. These are the people that were good and honorable but blinded by the craftiness of men, not valiant in the testimony of Jesus, those who died without the law, so maybe without the Mormon church, and they didn't do all the other things on the high path, they end up in the terrestrial kingdom. Then we have the low way, the dishonest, the liars, the sorcerers, the adulterers, and the whoremongers. Take a detour through hell, maybe a thousand years, I'm not sure about that, and then they end up in the telestial kingdom. So if we do all the right things, make the right choices, repent of our sins, we can make it to exaltation. We have to have baptism, temple endowment, temple marriage. And that is the plan of salvation. You can read about this in Wikipedia. In exaltation, Mormonism, and degrees of glory and plan of salvation. All right. Well, if we do all that and we make it into the celestial, what is life like in the celestial kingdom as gods and goddesses. Well, to sum it up uh, quickly, we will be resurrected, have a resurrected body. We will be perfect and all-knowing 
And hopefully, if we're in that top kingdom of celestial kingdom, we will be gods and goddesses. And here's a picture of planets out there in space. Uh, maybe one of these can become yours someday. Because if you follow the path of Mormonism, you can inherit your own planet. So we will inherit our own planet and produce our own spirit children to populate it, just like God and his wives. The Father has promised us that through our faithfulness, we shall be blessed with the fullness of his kingdom. In other words, we will have the privilege of becoming like him. To become like him, we must have all the powers of Godhood. Thus a man and his wife, when glorified, will have spirit children who eventually will go on an earth like this one. We are like this one that we are on and pass through the same kind of experiences, being subject to mortal conditions, and if faithful, then they also will receive the fullness of exaltation and partake of the same blessings. There is no end to this development. It will go on forever. We will become gods and have jurisdi jurisdiction over worlds, and these worlds will be peopled by our own offspring. We will have an endless eternity for this. Joseph Fielding Smith, 10th Prophet, Doctrines of Salvation. Okay, so we will inherit our own planet and produce our own spirit children to populate it, just like God and his wife or wives. When the servants of God and their wives go to heaven, there is an eternal union, and they will multiply and replenish the world to which they are going. So you're going to go to a world, and you're going to inherit that as your planet, and you're going to rule that planet as a god or a goddess, depending on your sex. Multiply and replenish that world with spirit children. And here is a picture of some children. This is Orson Hyde, Apostle Journal of Discourses, 1854. So we're going to have millions and billions of children. Uh, here's a pool that looks like it has about a million people in it. When we talk about celestial glory, we talk of the condition of endless increase. If we obtain celestial glory in the fullest sense of the word, then we have wives and children in eternity. Notice wives, plural. We have the power of endless lives granted unto us, the power of propagation that will endure through all eternity, all being fathers and mothers in eternity, fathers of fathers, mothers of mothers, kings and queens, priests and priestesses, and shall I say more? Yes, all becoming gods. George Q. Cannon, an apostle in the Journal of Discourses. So we know that spirit children, or we have a good idea that spirit children are born through a sexual relationship between the god and the goddess. So that kind of brings up the question of what a woman would be doing in eternity if it's really a sexual process. Is there going to be pregnancy? And is that woman, or are those wives going to be pregnant in eternity? And popping out millions and billions of babies doesn't sound too fun anyway this concludes the mormon cosmology and plan of salvation video